welcome you to a very exciting, a very special afternoon program uh, today. Uh, to be a Seventh-day Adventist is to face some interesting challenges. Because Seventh-day Adventists take the Bible very seriously. They also take God's other book, Nature, very seriously. And when you do both of those things, you sometimes face some interesting challenges. Uh, recently there was a conference in Utah that was put on by the General Conference, and it was an attempt to explore some of these issues of science and religion, creation and uh, nature. And uh, five of the six individuals on the panel attended that conference. And uh, the sixth is here because of uh, his uh, specialization in areas of religion and science. I understand that uh, some of the panelists enjoyed the conference very, very much, uh, and some of the others were a little less enthusiastic. Should be a good conversation. Looking forward to it. Let's pray as we begin. <coughs> Dear Lord, we come to you as human beings who see through a glass darkly, who know in part, and yet we seek to grow more and more into your image, into an understanding of who you are and how you put things together. Pray that you'd be with us this afternoon, that with your presence among us, we will all learn and grow. And in that possibility, we look forward to the great day when everything will be made plain. We thank you for your presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. Just one more thing I meant to mention that uh, we have uh, among us a new uh, person as far as Loma Linda is concerned, Suzanne Phillips here, who has assumed the chair of the Earth and Biological Sciences Department now in the School of Medicine. So that's a, that's a couple of changes. Uh, she is taking the place of Leonard Brand, who is at my far right and has served in that role for a long, long time. So in, in a small sense, this is kind of a coming out party of a, of a, a new shift. But Leonard's not leaving us. He's just uh, uh, doing less administration <coughs> for which he is grateful to Suzanne. So we want to welcome you, Suzanne, to our campus and thank Leonard for his years of service and turn it over to Jim Walters who will chair our discussion this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Dean Pauline. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, be able to uh, convene this panel uh, because these are challenging times for our Adventist church. That's on several fronts. And one of those fronts is the Bible and science. And if Adventism has a science-oriented university, uh, it is Loma Linda. And there are different views of science and the Bible right here at our university. Uh, in, in fact, uh, we have chosen this panel uh, to uh, to focus on some of those differences and what we have in common, uh, what, we, what we don't. Because uh, you folk do have differences among you, uh, we have invited you to be here with us and, and thank you for being here. Uh, I, I'm very sincere in that. And audience, here's how we will proceed. Uh, I'm going to say something about context uh, and introduce briefly uh, the different panelists. <coughs> And then each one of the discussants will present a formally agreed upon six minute point of view. Now that's rather short, but they will be able to develop ideas in dialogue with one another and with you uh, subsequently. And then we will have uh, discussion among ourselves and then we open it up for discussion with you uh, and we have a couple of mics uh, here at the front. The challenge for us this afternoon, I think, uh, as diverse panelists, is whether 
we can have a genuine meeting of our hearts and minds and in that logical order, I suggest. Or whether we bypass one another because of our being on different, being in different orbits. I think if here at Loma Linda we're able to pull this off, uh, there may be hope that the church at large will be able to. I remember uh, two or three years ago, I convened a panel, uh, had a couple of uh, political liberals and a couple of political conservatives, and I was a disaster as a moderator. Uh, we, we did not connect. Uh, I hope that this is not a repeat of that experience. Uh, I will not be neutral as a moderator, uh, although I plan to be fair, but as I've told the folk here, uh, I will be actively seeking for common ground, uh, common religious ground. Because our sacred texts have passages that are poles apart, uh, it's a challenge how we interpret uh, both uh, this book and the red books that we have. Uh, how do we interpret those as believers? Just look at the Bible on the treatment of enemies. Uh, in 1 Samuel 15, uh, you find God, Yahweh, commanding genocide against the Amalekites. Uh, man, woman, child, infant, all the cattle. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, you hear Jesus saying, it's been said to you, one thing I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So how do we interpret the text? How do we come together today as Adventists? Particularly today we're talking about the issue of science and religion. I've given you a handout uh, and it has Ellen White passages and the reason for collecting those uh, together was to suggest to you that the prophetess of this church can be appealed to by those who see themselves as progressives and those who see themselves as traditionalists. Uh, again, the question of hermeneutics, interpretation, uh, what sense we make of those texts which, uh, which are so, so formative for us as a people. Do, do all of you have that uh, that sheet? Does anybody not have it? Uh, Sheldon, can you see we have some hands up here if people who don't have it. If we could get it to them, that would be helpful. Also, we have uh, a pad which we're going to send around starting here at the front and going to the back. Uh, we have three pads and those you can sign up, give us your email address if you would like to have notification of similar events to this in the future. Let me um, introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, as uh, our dean suggested, uh, most of us have been at the conference that the General Conference held this summer. Uh, Rick Rice uh, was not, but he attended three similar sessions uh, that the church put on a decade ago, and he has written widely on these topics. So let me uh, introduce the, uh, the panelists, and uh, I will introduce them in the order that you see them, although this will not be the order in which they present. Um, Dr. Leonard Brand has already been uh, referenced. Uh, I was noticing, Leonard, in your CV that you've been here a long, long time. Uh, since 69, uh, he's been associated uh, most of those years as... In 1969, then. <laughs> uh, 1969, yes. Um, if we're, uh, we, we aren't living back in biblical times, but, uh, but yes, uh, he, he um, has uh, degrees from La Sierra, Loma Linda, and then he got his PhD at Cornell, and he focused on ecology and evolutionary biology. He's got uh, over 40 years of leadership here at Loma Linda. Uh, he has scores, literally scores, of publications uh, 
most of those in peer-reviewed journals, abstracts, uh, book chapters. He's also got numerous popular essays. He has several books that he has published, and he's made numerous presentations. Uh, Murray Jackson um, was um, a pastor in the Southern California Conference until he joined La Sierra just uh, three, six years ago. Wow. <laughs> Uh, he is an uh, assistant professor of pastoral ministry, <coughs> still assistant professor. Uh, and uh, he earlier did pastor uh, in Southern California. Uh, he has been an adjunct professor of philosophy uh, in uh, the L.A. area. Um, he does contract teaching for us here at Loma Linda in the area of ethics. Uh, his specialty is uh, social and philosophical theology, and uh, we're very happy that uh, Murray can be here with us. Uh, Paul Geem is a graduate of the School of Medicine. Uh, he also is a graduate of our School of Religion, uh, getting his MA in religion back in 77, the year he got his MD. He has primarily served as an emergency physician. He is currently teaching adv advanced cardiac life support here at Loma Linda. He's authored a book drawing on his two areas of expertise called Scientific Theology. He also teaches a Sabbath school class here at Loma Linda. Uh, Kenneth Wright is uh, associate professor uh, in the Department of Pathology and Human Anatomy here at Loma Linda. He is the program director of the anatomy graduate students. Um, he uh, is working on his MA in religion here at Loma Linda, and he got his PhD here in 92 uh, in anatomy. He's now uh, associate professor. He um, has some 15 published essays and book chapters. Uh, he also is a actor. He, he is active in theater uh, here at Loma Linda and also uh, at the Lifehouse here in Redlands. Uh, he has uh, not just been an actor, he has written, he has directed and produced. And he has a play, uh, Copenhagen, that's coming up in just another three weeks. Uh, three and four weeks, be looking for the publicity on that. And if you signed up on the, that pad coming around, we will uh, make sure that you get uh, personal information about that. Uh, Susie Phillips has already been mentioned. Uh, she uh, did come here this year from Southwestern where she was chairing her uh, biology department. She uh, is now chair of the uh, Earth and Biological Sciences uh, entity uh, in the School of Medicine here at Melinda. She uh, got her PhD uh, here at Loma Linda and then took a uh, postdoc at UCR. And uh, we're happy that you're here. Uh, Rick Rice, um, another um, veteran. Uh, is with us. Uh, he has uh, taught at La Sierra for some 25 years, and then some of us were successful in luring him this way, and he's been teaching here for seven, what, going on eight years, uh, Rick? 16. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> um, Time flies when you're having fun. Right? That's, that's, that's right, that's right, it does. Uh, Rick um, uh, has, uh, has written widely uh, following his, uh, his doctoral work at, uh, at the University of Chicago, and earlier we were colleagues at the seminary in Andrews. Um, probably his best known book is uh, The Openness of God. Uh, first came out in 1980, has been republished. Uh, his most recent book uh, came out uh, just in July, uh, University Press, uh, Suffering and the Search for Meaning. He's given a lot of thought to the theme of, uh, of our discussion today, and we're really happy for, for Rick's participation. Um, so we will um, 
we will now uh, have these six minute points of view and, uh, and you'll see uh, some coherence, I hope, uh, among the first three and the, uh, the last three. Uh, first will be uh, uh, Leonard Brand and then Paul Geem and then, then Susie Phillips and then uh, Murray Jackson, Ken Wright and Rick Rice. Uh, so Leonard, thank you. To uh, <clears throat> say things the way I want to, I'm going to read quite a bit of this. The, the St. George Conference on Science and the Bible was designed as an educational experience for SCA teachers. There were um, teachers invited from all the world divisions, about 460 participants in all. To describe the plan and purpose of the St. George Conference, I will first describe a background concept. We can ask what options there are for educated, intelligent people for the relationship between faith and science. The category educated, intelligent people includes a wide variation from conservative Bible-believing Christians to individuals who believe there is no God, the Bible is an interesting collection of myths and legends, we are the result of millions of years of evolution, and religion is an evolved psychological phenomenon. So that's a very wide um, spectrum. And you find educated, intelligent people all across the board. If we are discussing this question in relation to the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, we are talking about a small subset <coughs> of intelligent, educated people. The Seventh-day Adventist denomination is based on the belief that God is a very real personal being. He is the literal creator of life and the universe. The Bible is divinely inspired factual record. Some may say this narrows the possibilities, but in fact it broadens the range of possibilities for Earth history beyond what is allowed in the usual 21st century naturalistic scientific culture. The St. George Conference uh, was not designed as a free-for-all discussion of the whole range of options. There were a series of three conferences, international conferences in the early 2000s, that deliberately brought together people from, from the whole spectrum uh, to talk about these things. But this, this conference, that was not its purpose. It was a presentation of how the Seventh-day Adventist belief system deals with questions of faith and origins. What answers can we give for scientific evidence? And what unanswered questions do we have? Both of these aspects were presented frankly with informed discussion. I, I've heard some people say, well, this was a secret conference. Uh, no, it was not secret. The, the presentations were videotaped and they will be available when, when all the preparation is done. <clears throat> the conference was planned for active SDA college teachers to prepare them to answer questions about science, faith, and origins. Because of this, not all interested parties were invited, nor was there room. This was not an open discussion of whether fundamental belief number six is correct. <coughs> the planners assumed from the beginning that all in attendance were SDAs, and thus in basic agreement over that belief. That was the goal of the conference, and of course a single conference will not accomplish um, and answer all of these questions. But it provided a broad um, introduction to the topic. All right. Less than six minutes. That didn't take long. Um, okay, uh, <coughs> now we will go to uh, Paul Gein. Um, I thought that perhaps to start out with, it might be worthwhile understanding how much agreement there is actually between uh, the various viewpoints represented here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the panelists to raise their hand with a thumb up for yes, the thumb down for no, the thumb sideways for yes and no, the thumb partly down, you have, a, you have a whole range of answers and if you want to, you don't have to say anything. You can just either leave your hand down or put it out. So, just... I'm going to fold my hands in prayer, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, now, now, just anticipating this, I have no idea what you're going to be asking, but what of those 
who want to have a more nuanced response than what your hand signals would allow? Well, you can, uh, uh, you can put your hand out saying that's too simplistic, if you like. Okay, so, so if, if those who want... If, if you put it out, we will <laughs> assume that, that you don't really want to say. Okay. So, okay, so okay, okay. Is, is, that, is, is this fair, panelists? Do you agree with uh, this? I didn't know this would be a catechism, Jim. Is that what you envision? <laughs> this isn't a catechism. This is, a, this is an understanding of where everybody sees things. We'll start with one that I think everybody will agree with, but we'll find out for sure. Um, uh, 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 Paul, uh, Ken has just whispered to me, uh, and it makes some sense, is that rather than your pigeon holding people uh, to let them speak what they want to say in their six minutes and then we'll engage in discussion, then you can, you can well, see where people are. Well, the reason are. why is because we're not going to get very far if we do that. I want us to talk to each other, but it has to be about something. And I don't want to run over ground that everybody agrees with. Um, it, 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 it almost looks like you are taking over our discussion by, by doing this. Um, Let's. Um, well, let me, let me give you my first question, and then uh, and then you can decide from there whether you want to squash this or not. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the chair uh, says let's the first let's, let's have question, one question is: Is there a God? Now, I hope that we can all agree on that, but I'd like to be absolutely sure before we move on. No. <laughs> uh, you, you wanna, is that question? too nuanced? Well, what, what's the second question? Well, first, let's answer the first question, if that's an adequate question. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think, Paul, let's not get involved in this in this. Uh, Okay. Of our we don't, we don't want to, to be clear on where we stand. Well, I want you to be clear on where you stand, and then we're going to talk. Yes. Okay. Rather than just okay, well, rolling it out and hoping. Well, you want to talk to them in terms of how they answer your basic questions. Okay. I want you to talk to them in light of what they say about themselves. So, if you would. We're going to, we have time for inner panel discussion. That's coming. Now we would like to hear your point of view. Please. Okay. I will put my point of view out as carefully as I can. Thank you. Number one, I believe there is a God. Number two, I believe that God created the universe. And number three, I believe that God is able to intervene or change his ways or however you wish to express that. There are a number of different theological ways of, of looking at it. Mine is he does something unusual. But uh, in any case, that the laws of nature are not, that we know of anyway, are not so inexor inexorable that we can rule out things such as miracle. Okay? And that being the case, it is theoretically possible to see evidence in nature of God's action in a way that he is not usually seen as acting. That being the case, Some kind of detection of divine activity is legitimate. And whether one agrees with intelligent design as a, uh, as a quasi-scientific, quasi-political, if you wish, uh, point of view. In other words, they may or may not have identified the, pro the appropriate places 
where God has changed his activity or has acted in nature, or however you must wish to phrase that, um, that the project is not illegitimate. There are places where it looks like the project has been successful, such as in the origin of light. That being the case, the current scientific consensus which opposes intelligent design is simply wrong. That means that the current scientific consensus, and especially in areas that are theologically important, can be, uh, I wouldn't say ignored, but, but does not have probative value. Afterwards, there are two important theological questions, one of which it involves whether humans uh, were descended from lower animals, and one of which involves how much time did it take, which is intimately interconnected with whether there was a worldwide flood or not. The conference took the view, or most of the conference uh, presenters, probably all of them, took the view that <coughs> the time frame for what we see in the geological record is in fact short. And that time does not uh, does not have uh, the, the, the current kind of scientific consensus on the age of the earth is also wrong. There were a lot of scientific evidences for that point presented. I did some, some of our other panelists did some. I think that if we're asking a question, which was asked, which is, um, good science, literal Bible, what gives, that those points are particularly important because they speak to that very issue. Those who haven't listened to them perhaps should hear at least the major outlines of those kinds of points. That's, I think, speaking directly to the issue. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, Susie Phillips, please. As Leonard's successor, I'll go ahead and commandeer the minutes that he did use. <laughs> First, I want to uh, clarify the meeting, of, the purpose of the meeting. I was one of the planners, so for the last three years, I have been working uh, together with the Department of Education, not Department of Education, Education Department at the GC, as well as the Faith and Science Council, to uh, to work this conference out. The purpose of the conference was to educate educators. Therefore, that was who was invited. Um, we invited the academic dean, the chair of the science, and the chair of religion from every Seventh-day Adventist in, um, higher um, institution in the world. Um, so there were a number of people uh, invited. A number of them could not come, and so they sent people from their departments. We also invited a number of graduate students who plan and would like to be teachers in uh, Seventh-day Adventist schools. The purpose was, therefore, to uh, a, a couplefold um, inform those there uh, of the position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in terms of our methodology for interpretation of scripture, and um, not a discussion of fundamental belief number six. Instead, um, a presumption that, that those who are there were Seventh-day Adventists, and with if-then statements, if Seventh-day Adventists, then um, there's a, we as Seventh-day Adventists view the Bible and interpret the Bible as, in a certain way. 
And therefore, we wanted to um, give those educators uh, information about what their textbooks say, give them information about what their textbooks don't say. <clears throat> the title of the conference was an International Conference on Bible and Science Affirming Creation, and that's what the conference was about. Um, so in the affirmation of creation, we looked at a number of examples in science where uh, scientific data has been brought forth either by creation scientist or by um, a secular scientist that put, call into question uh, the authenticity of the theory of evolution. These are things that you don't often find in textbooks um, because textbooks are heavily, heavily uh, gleaned and, and, and worded that you find in college, I'm talking about college textbooks and high school textbooks, uh, are carefully scrutinized by those who, of course, have an agenda to only teach evolution in our country. So we wanted to be fair to the science. We wanted to present to them things like uh, the Y chromosome in humans and its comparison to the chimpanzee chromosome. Our other chromosomes are really, really similar, but not the Y chromosome. If we're evolved from or have a common ancestor with, there should be more similarity there, and it's just not there. The very, that very fact calls into question the entire theory. There are many small, very facts that call, call into question the entire theory, but these small facts that call those things into, into question are not often discussed or talked about, certainly not at scientific meetings, and certainly not in college textbooks. And so, uh, education department of the GC, uh, the scientists who are Seventh-day Adventist Christians who believe in the literal word of God, uh, wanted to let these things be known, wanted to communicate to these things to our science teachers, to our religion teachers, that you're not hanging out there just on a random faith statement, but there is, it says in the Bible over and over, God has not left himself without a testimony. Um, and we, we, we believe that to be true. Just look around at yourselves. We're the most miraculous thing on this planet, and we are very far gone away from figuring out how we work. If we figured out, if we knew how we worked, we might be able to do a little bit more about the fact that we die here after 100 years. Um, we, we might be able to fix that problem. <coughs> so, uh, at the conference, the science talks uh, address those things. Address those things that you don't hear about in textbooks. Address the, the research that's being carried out by scientists who believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible. Address concepts that are problems. We didn't just ignore the fact and pretend like all the research uh, supports creation. Obviously, there's research out there that is interpreted to um, heavily uh, support evolution. So we addressed those things. We talked about those things. And in all honesty, we don't have answers for all of them. Part of that issue has to do with the millions and millions of dollars that are being spent by our government um, on, on departments like evolutionary biology, who their entire goal is to prove biology. Now, how many millions and millions and millions of dollars are being put into the scientists who are trying to figure out um, if creation is really right? Well, there's like 100,000, I can just tell you that about right now. And there's a handful of maybe 15 scientists who's asked who, who that is their goal as they go about researching. So the fact that we have anything to stand on at all, which we do, there's a lot of support, evidence, um, a lot of scientific literature that supports um, our perspective, which is God created the world. Um, the fact that there's all that support out there, even on the minimal uh, amount of support that we get for research is, is phenomenal. God has blessed us, and I, and I praise the Lord that although I do have faith, he's not, he's not just left us without uh, a testimony in nature as well. Additionally, uh, 50, about 50% 50 of the conference dealt with, dealt with theology. To affirm the SDA methodology of, his, of historical grammatical method of interpreting scripture, we use this method because that's what, what was used by other biblical authors as they referenced the scriptures, they themselves. God himself seems to use this reference by saying things like, for I spoke and it came to be, and in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Where is that from? Written in stone, my friends. And he says, behold, I'm making all things new. So God himself testifies that um, his, the literal account of creation is there, and that, that you find in other places in scripture. We believe these things he says about himself because we have found him to be true. We believe these things because we each have a personal relationship with God. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. If it was strictly evidence out there, and you looked at all the evidence, and that was your reason for believing in God, that is unacceptable. 
These things are spiritual. And spiritual things are spiritually discerned. It is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Thank you. Now we will uh, turn to our last uh, three presenters, uh, Murray Jackson, uh, Ken Wright, and, uh, and Rick Rice. Uh, so, uh, Murray, please. Well, I, I guess I begin by saying my reflections on that conference reminded me of when I finished my doctorate at Claremont, I went to celebrate with my church and my pastor emeritus, <coughs> Dr. Edmund Jones, put his arm on my shoulder and said, Murray, I was always impressed with people who had doctorates until I got mine. <laughs> and I discovered they learn more and more about less and less until they know a whole lot about nothing. Um, and the reason I'm starting this way because I take away that a lot of irony from the conference. And here's the irony. On the one hand, we had natural scientific presentations that let me see how I can say this. We're protesting their secular, non-theistic colleagues who were trying to reduce the irreducible complexity of nature. Fair. But the oddity was the selected theological presenters were protesting their colleagues who would not reduce the irreducible complexity of Scripture. So on the one hand, you had a reductionism going on, and on the other hand, you had a protest of reductionism. And I thought that that was, that was ironic. Um, and given the small sliver of representatives of, of Adventist theologians who I believe, and I conferred with many of my colleagues who were at other institutions who we met up there, whether or not those presenters were at the extreme end on just the seminary faculty, and the answer was yes. I, I think that made, because of some of the, the presentations by those scholars uh, was not resonating as credible, it made me then wonder how credible the scientific presentations, and it's out of my field. And so it, that was a part of the challenge for me, personally. Um, there was also kind of an irony about the judgment of the historical critical method interpretation of scripture. And in fact, one person stood up uh, and said, as a biblical scholar who uses the historical critical method of interpretation, and he went on to ask his question, to show that maybe some official body made some judgment that Adventists don't use it, but actually all over Adventist scholars are using it. And in fact, it's a, historically, it's a historically critical judgment about the nature of the Bible, even when you say it's such that we shouldn't use the historical critical method. It's almost like saying, uh, I don't believe we should do philosophy. Well, then that's your philosophy, right? <laughs> Everyone is using this method. Of course, there were extreme examples that were lifted up, but there's a, a spectrum of a range of how to understand the methodology. And I think it was just disingenuous where we would hear those biblical theological scholars talk about the problems with feminist interpretations of scripture, liberation interpretations of scripture, historical critical methods interpretation of scripture, and then they say what we should take is the biblical method. Oh well, wow. It meant to me they were not self-reflective of their own social location. <laughs> because we just found out that uh, Paul also has one more thing he believes. God is male-gendered. He's been speaking about God in the, in the male pronoun, he, his, right? This is about social location. And maybe to just kind of wrap up what I have to say br briefly, one of the uh, scholars, and this made me think about the, the question of social location and, and <coughs> convening a conference with world <coughs> institution educators. One of them told me, he said, you know, Maury, I don't, I don't really buy what's being done here. He said, but where I come from, they aren't asking the questions, was nature created in six days? They are asking, how can I 
stop nature's gods from messing in my life. And he said, as one who comes from over in Africa, I can tell you, even though I don't buy this, the per diem they gave us for the time that we're here is $176, and that is a month's salary from where I come. So as a pastor, I look at this in a very socio-political um, forces. Namely, how do we shepherd a discourse on something like this, where we bring together voices with three criteria, to be biblically faithful, to be rationally coherent, to be empirically sound. And then let's listen and see what the real Adventist voices sound like. And not cherry pick a handful of people uh, to say this is the Adventist view, rather than this is a voted position of somebody somewhere. But what's actually happening on the ground might be much different. Amen. Amen. Okay, now we will uh, go to uh, Ken Wright, please, Ken. Okay. And like Leonard, I'm going to use some paper so that I, spontaneity is not one of my gifts. So, one of the things I... You're, you're an actor. I know. <laughs> one of the things that I appreciated about the conference, as both Leonard and Susie have mentioned, is that the agenda was stated up front right from the beginning. So there really were not any surprises. So I would like to, as well, be very upfront about uh, my perspective on this conference. Uh, I've taught various aspects of human anatomy for almost 20 years at Loma Linda University. And as I've studied anatomy and uh, been involved with teaching, uh, I've recently become interested in the intersection of faith and science. My desire is to gain more insight into the origins and changes in life forms on Earth. And so I enrolled in the master's program in religion and the sciences here in the School of Religion at Loma Linda. Uh, and I'm currently taking courses in that program. The program has been helpful, a helpful way of exploring the points, uh, the contact points between faith and how it describes the world, and science and how it describes the world. Both ways of describing the world are important to me professionally and personally. In reading and in conversing, I've been impressed that the immense complexities of life, from the most basic proteins that make up the simplest organisms, all the way to the human brains that make this conversation possible today, all seem to point to a creator, to the creator, as our faith affirms. But I've also been impressed, as I've read and conversed, that the physical features of the observable world, from stalactites growing in caves at a fairly known rate, to ice core samples taken from the poles, to island chains like the Galapagos and the Hawaiian Islands, uh, that as they form in volcanic hotspots, it seems like the islands the farther away from the hotspots have more erosion, more biodiversity, and, and an older age to the movement of tectonic plates, forma formation of mountain ranges, all of these physical features seem to a point to a conclusion that the world may be older than uh, has been suggested. And so this process of becoming that uh, it's, it's taken maybe a little bit longer, a longer period of time as our scientific enterprises confirm. So going into the Utah conference and coming to this discussion today, my starting point our reverence for the Creator that affirms our faith, and recognition of the possibility of long generative processes that our science confirms. During the Bible and Science Conference, I enjoyed and appreciated a number of the scientific presentations and learned many things from them. One, in, I'll just mention one as an example, but there were many excellent presentations. One that was new to me was a discussion by Art Chadwick from Southwestern University about his explanation for the fossil forest in Yellowstone. It's an interesting conversation, and if you don't know anything about it, it's worth reading about. On the other hand, I felt a bit uncomfortable with several different things. First of all, the uh, events billing as a Bible and science conference, but I felt unsettled by the pre prevalent use of Ellen White's commentaries in a way that I suspect might have even made Ellen White a little bit uncomfortable herself. It seems as though uh, her commentaries were used not merely to complement scripture, 
but perhaps to serve as an extension of scripture or even at times to supersede the word scripture themselves. Numerous extended quotations from her commentaries were often used, were often the key means of reaching conclusions on how to understand creation and the flood narrative. As a side note, I just learned recently um, that at the annual council of the General Conference in Silver Spring last week, delegates voted changes to Adventist statements of fundamental beliefs. Among the changes proposed and voted was a revision of fundamental belief 18 on the gift of prophecy that Adventists have applied to Ellen White. The revision took, uh, took out the words as the Lord's messenger and continuing authoritative source of truth for the church, referring to Ellen White and her writings. This was to avoid the impression that Ellen White and the Bible are equivalent sources of truth according to marginal notes. To me, the irony is that while the church at the, an, uh, at the annual council affirmed a view of sola scriptura that does not include Ellen White, one of the attendees at the Bible and Science Conference could be forgiven for concluding that the presenters there hope to steer the church in exactly the opposite direction. Let me perhaps uh, slightly ironically point to Ellen White's writings about education to drive home the point. She says the work of true education, in her book entitled Education, is to teach people to be thinkers and not mere reflections <coughs> of other people's thoughts. If this conference erred on one side or the other, it probably erred on the side of teaching people to be reflectors of Ellen White's own thoughts. The second uh, thing that made me feel uncomfortable was a speech made on the first day to all of the attendees uh, that we were told that unless we supported the literal interpretation of, of Genesis 1 through 11, from within the confines of a very recent event based on a literalistic understanding of the Bible and Ellen White's commentary and accepted the concept of a, a recent global flood event that we are not authentic Adventists and we should resign our positions if we're working in an Adventist institution. I felt as though this speech knowingly overlooked the fact that thoughtful, devoted Seventh-day Adventists around the world have long represented a plurality of views of creation and other issues. Worse, I felt that though this speech called into question the entire faith experience of every thoughtful, devoted Seventh-day Adventist who has come to different understanding, it shut the door to the possibility of any meaningful dialogue like this one today by casting suspicion on all viewpoints Adventists hold in creation but the narrowest one. Given that prescriptive, uh, prescriptive framework of only one correct way to understand creation, it felt as though the editing and voting of the consensus statement that was formed toward the end of the conference was primarily about the validation of a predetermined outcome. Um, just in closing, um, someone has mentioned that there have been several such conferences in the past, and I attended one in 2011 at Banff in Canada. And the spirit there struck me as much more distinctly different than this one. There was an, acknowledge, there was an acknowledgement of various viewpoints, what I perceive to be a genuine attempt to listen to multiple perspectives and at least a surface level openness to diversity. And to me, the Banff Conference, more than the Utah Conference, exemplified what the Adventist Church needs most. As has become clear with the denomination-wide study on ordination, we differ over how to interpret the Bible. We differ significantly over whether or not to ordain women. As in the study of ordination, the church has undergone a long process of listening and dialogue to understand the many ways uh, the, view is, uh, the issue is viewed. So, two, the issue of faith and science, more listening and more dialogue is needed. We should not willfully overlook the diversity of views that will continue to exist within the church. And whatever we do, we should never tell people whose views differ from ours that they should get out. Amen. It's our diversity that makes us vibrant and helps to keep us honest. Okay, uh, now we'll uh, go to, uh, to uh, Rick Rice, who will have the final uh, six-minute comment, and then we will open up <coughs> to the panelists. Rick. Well, I should thank my fellow panelists for this report of the conference in St. George. I was not there. And that leaves me wondering why I am here. <laughs> so unlike the other participants, I was not in attendance. So along with most of us, I've listened with great interest to their descriptions of what happened. However, I have been on other conferences. Uh, one unforgettable experience was the Geoscience 
Research Institute Field Study Conference of 1976. Leonard Brand and his wife were along on that. How long was it, Leonard? About six weeks? Yeah. It went on and on. We were all the way from the Paluxy River to Yellowstone to uh, um, lots of places in between. That's right. Um, and they brought along their infant son, Dennis. Um, my wife was expecting our son. She stayed at home, and he was born in October of that year. Actually, Leonard and I go back far beyond that. Uh, we met playing in the trombone section of the La Sierra College Orchestra in the 60s, the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, like the brands, my wife and I have a son and a daughter. I think you had a son and then a daughter. We had a daughter and then a son. And they all four competed together on a swim team for a number of years. And I might add, they were all excellent swimmers. Okay? They were very good. So we go back uh, quite a ways, and, uh, but, um, and some of the others, Paul and I traveled together uh, during a, a study tour of the Middle East about three years ago, was it three or four, something like that. Along with Jim Walters. Along with Jim Walters, that's right. I have a great picture of you, Paul, on a donkey in front of the Zoser's Pyramid in Egypt. I don't think I ever sent that along, did I? I don't think you did. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, it's uh, one strong man. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, I've just had the pleasure of meeting Susie the second time right now. We had a conversation uh, last year sometime. <laughs> now, the other two on the panel, Maury was a student of mine. So uh, I always listen to what my former students say with great interest <laughs> to know if I should take credit or uh, utter an emphatic disclaimer for <laughs> having ever had influence on his life. And Ken has been a student of mine to a, a, a lesser degree, I would say, in the sense that uh, he's been a graduate student in our program in religion and sciences. So my perspective on these issues is a bit different from the ones you've heard here. Um, I have attended con the series of conferences that Leonard referred to earlier, a series of three summer conferences, 2002, 3, and 4, uh, and the goal of which was to lay out some of the differences. And as Leonard has indicated, the, the more recent conference was not necessarily to explore all the differences, but to present a particular perspective in a way that educators might have a clear grasp of it and be able to communicate it uh, effectively in the classrooms and to their students. I've also attended a number of conferences sponsored by the Templeton Foundation, uh, meeting with uh, scholars in religion and science, and of course trying to get a handle on their perspective of uh, the sorts of issues that Adventists have been interested in for a long time. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I am the least sophisticated person in the room when it comes to science. In fact, as I look around the room, I, it seems to me in, in every seat there's someone who would be better equipped to deal with these issues than I am. There are people who've uh, studied them at great length, people with scientific sophistication. My most advanced class in mathematics was sophomore geometry in high school. <laughs> My most challenging class in science was high school physics. So you know that my naivete is expansive <laughs> and inclusive. So I listen to scientists talk to each other with great interest, but not always with great comprehension. Um, and at the same time, I must say that for me, the questions that come up when, when we talk about the issues of science and religion have not been, uh, shall we say, earthquaking, earth shaking, <laughs> earthquaking, earth shaking issues for me personally. There's a sense in which I, uh, the fundamental reliability of the claims of Christianity as presented to me in, in through Adventism were so. Um, foundational to my life as a young person. Our family had great difficulties for uh, several years when I was a child, and my parents eventually divorced. And it was that, that supportive, relatively small Adventist community, and their, uh, their way of caring for our family, and their way of affirming Adventism, that ever since has given me a, a deep confidence that what Adventists have to say and what they understand about God, the world, and all the rest of it is, uh, 
is profoundly reliable. So I, I, I haven't found myself in a, in a kind of an existential uh, position of wondering if my whole faith can survive a look at science and religion. Now, as a theologian, there's a sense in which um, I have to stop and listen because theologians never get the first word. When it comes to interpreting the Bible, we listen to the biblical scholars who spend uh, years acquiring the expertise to look at the documents in the original language and, uh, and, and explore their formulation and so on. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, interpreting the Bible, we, uh, we listen to the biblical scholars. Uh, then, on the other hand, we listen to scientists who are trained in the study of natural phenomena. I don't have a PhD in science, or a master's in science, or a bachelor's in science. So I'm, I try to listen as carefully and as sympathetically <coughs> as I can to, to follow the line of reasoning, the sort of evidence and concerns that they have. Um, at the same time, having listened as carefully as possible, we seek theologians to incorporate and integrate these insights within a comprehensive and coherent interpretation of faith for our time. Uh, so here's where I, I stick my neck out. Even though we don't get the first word, we try to have the last word. <laughs> or at least an afterword uh, about the ongoing discussion of issues that are important to the life of the community. And this brings me to another concern I have as a community, uh, as a theologian. My principal object of concern is the life of the community. Theology is not an abstract occupation pursued in ivory towers of academia far removed from the demands of everyday life. Theology is a form of ministry. Its goal is to serve the church, to contribute to the upbuilding of the community of faith till we all come to the stature of Christ. So how can people with a variety of gifts, abilities, and a variety of perspectives, and even a variety of biblical interpretations and scientific conclusions, how can we be together in the same Christian community? How can we identify and affirm what we share in a way that promotes mutual understanding and mutual respect, even when it comes to matters where we find we have significant differences in viewpoint. That's my concern. Can we achieve unity within the body of Christ without insisting on uniformity when it comes to lots of different issues? Now, I don't mean to gloss over the difficulties. I think we will find uh, different sorts of tension, shall we say. Uh, one sort of tension is different interpretations of specific issues. Another sort of tension would be how important agreeing on a particular interpretation is to the life of the community. And people may discover that they have different uh, perspectives on how important this issue is. For some people, clearly, it's vitally important. For others, it may not be quite that important. It may be something where we can allow for a range of views. So I think, but at the same time, the biggest question Christianity in general faces in the modern world is how to respond to science. How can we bring together or coordinate or reconcile our religious convictions and affirmations with the conclusions of scientific investigation? This is an unavoidable challenge for Seventh-day Adventists because of our commitment to education, which grows out of our understanding of the human of human nature. Okay. God has placed within us a capacity, a desire, an ability to understand the world in which we live, to reach out and apprehend it. If we were the kind of community that was not interested in engaging the world in raising major questions of intellectual significance, we wouldn't have a panel like this today. We would just have a statement that everybody could agree on, and if there were differences, we would just tell people not to ask questions. But we are a community that has reached out. We're committed to education. We're committed to engagement with the world in a variety of different ways, intellectually, uh, socially, and uh, in, in other ways as well. So the, the fact that we're facing this as a challenge, I think, is a testimony to the strength of our community and our willingness to engage in serious, uh, in, in serious thought and in considering serious reflections. Well. There are sources of tension between science and religion. Uh, the one I think we're dealing with here is the conclusions. It looks like a particular interpretation of the Bible leads to conclusions 
that conventional science completely disagrees <coughs> with. Well, that would be one sort of tension. Another would be sources of evidence. Science relies on empirical evidence. Scientific arguments don't go beyond, at least the, as it's explained to me by scientists, beyond what the evidence fully supports. Well, clearly, uh, as has already been indicated, faith reaches beyond the evidence. Trust is more than just coming to a conclusion and stopping uh, on a provisional basis. Uh, we're going beyond. So there's a tension there between the kind of commitment that faith involves and the, uh, the, the provisional nature and the guarded nature of scientific inquiry. Um, we could talk about the scientific community and its difference from, uh, from religion. I know I've exceeded my time, Jim, so thanks for this. Um, but I'm reminded, I'm reminded, I ran into this statement in a, a book by Ian Pears, an instance of the finger post, but just to, to sort of highlight the difference between believers and scientists, the question comes up, one of the characters asks, how is it that when a man of God shifts his opinion, it proves the weakness of his views? And when a man of science does so, it demonstrates the value of his method. So I think we've got some tensions there between the, the general posture of the believer and the posture of the scientist that needs to be borne in mind. Now, I've taken more time than I should. Perhaps we can come to some of these other issues. But I noticed, Leonard, on our field study conference that there were positions presented when it came to the interpretation of Earth history that struck me as quite different from what I had heard uh, about the Edmonds position growing up that uh, there was allowance made for the possibility that the Earth was billions of years old as far as its inorganic matter is concerned, and yet you could have an old Earth and young life, and that would be perfectly in harmony with uh, the, you know, the, you know, I'm talking about the, the head of geoscience at that time of his perspective. Um, I think I've seen some changes in biblical interpretation in the sense that I think uh, from both our scientists and our biblical scholars now, uh, from the opening statement of Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then what follows in Genesis 1, as if the, the opening verse refers to the fact that God creates, or the affirmation, God creates the whole rea of reality, and the second, uh, the rest of the chapter referring just to uh, what God did with this particular planet. So it, it, I, I would see there the fact that there have been developments in Adventist interpretation as perhaps an indication that that an openness to the possibility of developing interpretations is something that we should have. It seems to me I've seen it on the part of both Adventist scientists and Adventist biblical interpreters. So I would just uh, appeal, Jim and fellow panelists, <laughs> to uh, a commitment to identify the things which we hold in common without glossing over the differences that we have and uh, realize that we can all be a part of the community uh, that we all value so much. Let, let's thank all of our panelists for their presentation. Okay, I'm going to lead a discussion uh, with the panelists uh, before we do open it up to the floor uh, to see what, um, what common ground we do have. Uh, I think it's quite evident the, uh, the differences that uh, exist among us. Um, um, let's, let's start with that last, one of the last points that, uh, that Rick Rice made, and that is the fact that it does seem that there has been development in terms of both <coughs> theology and uh, views of scientific matters uh, in the church. When it comes to theology, it goes all the way from what the, the view of the shut door and what that means. Uh, it also in, includes uh, something no less important than the person of Jesus Christ from being the first of those that were created to being God in God's self. Um, you know, and, and there have been other developments. Uh, Professor Rice referred to uh, something more contemporary, and that is the view of Genesis 1 and 2 uh, having to do with uh, the age of the dirt. Uh, it, maybe the, the first question is, is, is just a descriptive issue. Uh, have there been these developments, or have there not been? Uh, ha have there been these? These changes? Um, 
perhaps, uh, Dr. Brand, you, uh, given your tenure uh, in regard to these issues, uh, you could comment at least on the one having to do with uh, the age of the of the dirt. Have Adventists changed their views on that over the last few decades? I'm assuming the question is being asked with the possibility that, <clears throat> okay, if we've changed on that, maybe we need to change on other things. Um, that one is kind of a unique one, actually. Seventh-day Adventists, by, by many of our, of our uh, conservative Protestant colleagues um, or denominations, we are thought to be rather liberal, because for a long time we have thought that the, the whole universe was not created on day four of our creation week. Now, I, I might, you know, you might be interested in where that comes from. Actually, the idea that, that the universe is older actually comes from Ellen White. So, um, take that for whatever you, you want. Um, but we, we, our, our understanding of the, of the Great Controversy indicates that life was here in other parts of the universe. It came our turn, God prepared us, and so we differ, and, that's, and we have for a very long time. <coughs> uh, a lot of the other things we study are, are in a different category, because we really can get real evidence on them, and things have changed. Uh, I, I just mentioned one instance from this uh, same field trip that you're talking about, Rick. I remember one, uh, one geologist there who had a different view of things than, than many others in the church. Uh, at, at one location called the Goosenecks of the San Juan, where a meandering river has cut a very deep, straight down uh, canyon, maybe a thousand feet deep, and the argument was made, okay, this had to have taken a very long time because uh, meandering rivers cut very slowly moved only the flow very slowly. Well, I, I wondered about that. When I got home, I started dug in the scientific and the geological literature, found that that argument was, had been out of date for, for already 10 years. Um, so geologists understand that, that meandering rivers don't cut straight down canyons. That has to be cut very rapidly. So, um, but there is one thing I'd like to speak about in relation to this. Um, and what was your point about the, uh, the, the the steep banks to the river? That sometimes, you know, it, I'm introducing an idea about science. What is science? I, um, I've i heard at times a very dear friend, a uh, theologian, make comments that, <coughs> that science has facts, religion has assumptions. What is often understood is that, not understood, is that science uh, has some very important assumptions. And often science, in fact, goes way beyond the evidence because of the assumptions. Let me just give one, one uh, sort of most striking example. If you read what science has to say, um, there is a very uniform commitment to the idea that the first life came about not by creation, but by a series of random events over very long periods of time. Okay, let me just stick, take two, make two hypotheses. One. God created the first life forms, the other one, no, the first life was not created by any God. Okay, what scientific experiments are you going to do to test them? Well, there, there is, there, uh, so why is science so committed to a naturalistic view of the origin of life? There's no evidence, absolutely no evidence to say that that's the right interpretation. That's held because of the, uh, of the assum of an assumption, the assumption of naturalism. And that assumption uh, has very broad application and influences many other scientific conclusions, which takes them way beyond uh, the evidence. And if we had time, we could really talk about that in depth. But science is a combination of assumptions and evidence, especially when you're dealing with history, with origins, geology, paleontology, <coughs> evolution of biology. Um, oh, okay, assumptions okay. have a very, have <coughs> often a very controlling influence. Okay, uh, Leonard, you, you've got your time back uh, from, from what you saved uh, early on. Okay. Thank you. Um, on this issue of development, uh, has, there, has there been development? And uh, you know, then if there has been, then we can talk about the relevance of it or the irrelevance of it. But uh, uh, am, am I right uh, in terms of Adventist history that uh, something of no less consequence than the nature of Jesus Christ uh, has had a, uh, a sea change in the Adventist Church? Um, 
Uh, Rick, you uh, are, are uh, resident, and Murray, our resident uh, theologians here. Uh, is that true? I think that's a fact. We live in a historically conditioned world, and we're always changing. I mean, this is a part of, I think, the challenge of this notion of even the idea of what is now maybe some, some um, effort to say Adventists use a model of interpretation that is not historical critical method. I don't think any Adventist believes that God tossed out of heaven a Bible and it hit somebody on the head. It had a life development in history and that requires judgment. That's what criticism is. Judgment about the historical development. And because we are historically conditioned beings, we change. And a lot of our change has more to do with psychosocial development than anything else. And we then try to align our understanding of scripture with other things that we come to, to know and, and uh, view. So I, I think it's, it's obvious, it's a fact, yes. Uh, okay, what, um, let's see, maybe uh, Susie, uh, you, uh, Paul, would you care to comment on, uh, on development change in the church uh, theologically? Uh, you meant, made a reference, Susie, to, uh, to the literal word of God, and I think it was in reference to creation that it was written in stone. I mean, that sounds like there's not a lot of change. What, what do you make about this notion of Murray's idea that uh, we as historical beings do change? Well, obviously humans change, but God does not change. Amen. But are, are we... Are we are we privy to uh, to the final word on the God who doesn't change? Are humans ever privy to be the final word? Uh, I, I don't think so, and that's why uh, some might suggest that we, as we studied more the nature of uh, Jesus, we said uh, we had it wrong. We have a new view that's uh, that, that's better. Maybe I don't know that maybe. Oh, that, that Jesus, uh, that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are uh, together constitute uh, the divine, as, as opposed to Jesus being uh, outside of that circle, being a, a created creature. That's the Arian view. Well, I find in Isaiah that Jesus was divine, so I don't see there being a change. Um, so, no, like I said, I... I from my perspective, this is the authority, and um, we're instructed that we need to become like children. And if a child can understand this, my 10-year-old sitting up there, she can read this and she can understand it. I don't think that there's, there's any difficulty in understanding what was meant to be said here. The, the, the challenge is Jesus is not in Isaiah. And we have to be, yes, when you... T Jesus says he's in Isaiah. Jesus says that he, he's in Isaiah. Yes, yes, he does. Um, well, Isaiah doesn't say that about Jesus. And, and I guess the concern that we have to think about is when the, when the writer of Hebrews says that God was in Christ learning, learning is change. Um, so, yeah, we, can, we might proof text and say God changes not, but then we also see that God was in Christ learning. That's change. Um, what, is, what does this mean? And I think that for me, the, the, the challenge of the conference was that kind of biblical, theological work. And I don't think it rose to, this, to the intellectual capacity of the scientists there. They were, they, it wasn't in their field, so they, they didn't have the tools to understand what maybe those who had been trained in philosophy and theology had to, to maybe have it tough to stomach. But I spoke with numerous biblical scholars and theologians who were deeply troubled. And I might say a group at one table who said, you know, we're from Eastern Europe and we're more conservative. But the language of the president of the GC reminded us of dictators who ruled us. And so I'm more troubled by the discourse community than the content that was trying to be discussed. 
And for me as a pastoral theologian, this is, <laughs> this is what we ought to uh, really kind of attend to. How does our discourse community shape the kind of, um, as, the, as the poet says, he drew a circle to keep me out, heretic rebel, a thing to flout. Love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. How do we change our discourse community uh, such that we can have real scholarly debate on biblical interpretations, etc., uh, in a context that is not proof texting, but is also charitable to interpretations that don't share uh, my point of view? That, that's a that's a real concern of mine. Um, uh, Leonard made a reference to the fact that we have uh, people of. Uh, significant intelligence here, uh, education, that, that's not the issue. Uh, to me, the question is whether people of equal intelligence and education can see things differently and yet at another level be brothers and sisters. And I go back to what it seems to me is the the genius of Seventh-day Adventism as a Protestant denomination, not one that takes what some hierarchical, hierarchical figure in some distant city says, but takes seriously what we make of the Word of God, of the evidence that's before us from science uh, in our hearts. Uh, I refer to this passage that I gave you on that handout from the book Education where Ellen White speaks of men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Uh, it seems that appeal to conscience is a very important thing uh, in our Adventist tradition. We, we, we didn't want to organize in the 1840s and the 1850s. We finally did for pragmatic reasons in the 60s. Uh, but we resisted it because we would then not be able to follow our conscience as the forebears of Adventism weren't able to follow their conscience except being kicked out of the first day churches when they decided to follow the Sabbath or to follow William Miller. Uh, we resisted organization because we respected conscience as such. But the, the question that I have to, to panelists is, am I right or am I wrong in reading conscience as being so important in our tradition? And, and if I am right, uh, is that common ground that we might have to allow us of equal intelligence and education to see things differently. What do you think? Paul, your I, I would say yes. I think that it's very important to have dialogue. Um, I think that these issues cannot be settled totally by church vote um, because our tradition says that every man is and every woman uh, is supposed to be uh, uh, following his or her own conscience as well. I, uh, I think that there's a couple of things about dialogue that need to be stated. Uh, one of them uh, is be careful of assuming because sometimes your assumptions will go wrong. We heard uh, Mari here um, say that he uh, thought that he had learned that uh, my God is male. I used the term he as a shorthand, and in fact, I have written in the book Scientific Theology, which is available for free online, so you can check this out if you want to, www.scientifictheology.com. By the way, printed at La Sierra University, and uh, Rick Rice knows something about its uh, origin in printing, which we will leave unsaid. Uh, but um, but my, my point is that if you have to qualify everything you say, uh, at some point, your qualifications get so long, so tedious, that it takes too long to say it. 
And so it is not appropriate to simply assume that if somebody uses the male pronoun for God, which is after all the traditional one, that one agrees that God uh, has particular male characteristics and does not have female ones as well. And uh, back, back on, on the point. But back on the, back on the, back on the other point. I'm going to agree that we're not going to solve this by some kind of vote or edict. Because that uh, our conscience doesn't obey democracy and it doesn't obey dictatorship. But I'm also going to say something else and that is that I think that a a piece is missing here that has not been taken adequately into account. And that is that the protest, for example, against higher critical method of, of interpreting scripture is not because of the method itself. Because if you get into it, you'll find that, in fact, the, uh, histor the, uh, I think the biblical historical method or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, the one that is, is supported, is in fact looking at the same kinds of things. To whom was it written, uh, in what way, and so forth. But that historically, what has been called the historical critical method has assumed that God doesn't act in certain ways. And therefore, if the Bible is describing where it looks like God acted in at least ways that, that are proscribed, that the Bible will need some editing until it no longer says that. And that's the concern that's coming through. That, that if the Bible describes a flood, that that's just not physically possible and so therefore we need to reinterpret that part of the Bible until it agrees that there really didn't, that kind of event didn't really happen. But, but this, this has to do with the use of uh, that, what you're suggesting is perhaps a common methodology that uh, the biblical approach and the critical historical approach uh, may share. Uh, but back on, on the issue of, of conscience, it's, it seems like uh, you are suggesting that yes, uh, and here I'm taking a, a leaf from uh, Rick Rice, uh, given our emphasis on, on, uh, on education, given our emphasis on health and in institutions like Loma Linda, which practices scientific medicine, that it's not unusual that we might come to different conclusions in regard to knowledge, but uh, if we, it seems like you're suggesting we can follow our, and should follow our conscience as Adventists, although we may come to different places. Well, and I would I, even go so far as to say that if you do <laughs> as careful and honest as you know how, a study of the Bible, and you come to the conclusion that, you know what, the Sabbath really isn't important, the second coming isn't really important, actually we've got the day wrong, that you have an obligation to say to the Adventist Church, sorry about that, but you know, the things you stand for are things I can't stand for. And uh, if you happen to be teaching for the church, you should say, this is where I stand. Am I useful still in your teaching community? And if they say yes, then fine. And if they say, well, really, we'd rather have somebody else, then you say fine. Okay, okay. There I, comes I, a point I, I, where I, I, I think you need to step outside. But but what what do you do with the dynamism that uh, has existed in the Adventist Church, which keeps us from getting locked in at particular points? If that sort of approach had been taken with the shut door, or before we came to a consensus on the divinity of Jesus Christ, we would have made we wouldn't have, be where we are today. You know, at what point do we do we dig in? And, and, and rather than you answer that, maybe maybe someone else can can get into this discussion. Yes, Leonard. I've been in a lot of kinds of discussions of various sorts, and and 
If the Buddha discussion is profitable and can help us to grow, depends somewhat on the nature of the diversity. Um, if we can agree on certain basic things, yes, there's profitable discussion. If, if our differences are too great, the discussion never goes anywhere, and sometimes it becomes useless. So, so how, what are the parameters of, of, of helpful discussion? Uh, Rick Rice has written books on this, uh, Becoming, Behaving, Belonging. Uh, can you illumine this dialogue with, over here on this end of the table? I don't know, Jim. Uh, with the title of Good Science, Literal Bible, What Gives, uh, you somehow have presented us with a very provocative title in the quest of harmony and peace. <laughs> just, just what the strategy was there. Um, it's, I, I agree with Leonard. There, there needs to be some uh, identification of what's central, what holds us together, uh, the non-negotiables. I think the inference, Jim, of your question, uh, or, or your observation, that there have been significant changes theologically in the history of the Adventist Church, if the inference would be, well, therefore we could change pretty much anything and still be within the, uh, the spirit of Adventism, uh, all of us would probably raise a flag and say, well, now, wait a minute. I don't think just anything gives. Um, I think it's helpful to remember when some of the differences become rather sharpened. Uh, uh, something I read about a year ago says, nothing divides like common beliefs held with a difference. And uh, when some people in a community identify a particular perspective as essential to the life of the community and others don't see it quite that way, you, have a real, you may have a real challenge. And then it's important to try to find ways of affirming and articulating what's, what's central. One of the things that I think is helpful is to look um, outside the Adventist church and notice how different things look from a different perspective. My, uh, uh, I mentioned that my parents uh, divorced when I was a kid. My father remarried and had another family. So I have uh, a younger half-sister and half-brother, uh, significantly younger than I am, and I, my, uh, my half-brother, I think, got all of the scientific genes in the family, which is why I didn't get any, because uh, he finished college at the age of 19 with a double major in math and physics, and then has a PhD in physics from Caltech, and runs a consulting firm in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, does all sorts of, uh, of classified work for the government. And uh, we have become friends in, I guess you could say, our mature years, we didn't, uh, living across the country from each other, we didn't get to know each other at all. Now, by the time my father remarried, uh, his conservative Adventist upbringing was far in his past, and so my half-brother has none of the religious convictions that I do. Um, I think of him as an atheist without an attitude. That is to say, he's not running away from something that he's disillusioned with. He's just looking at religion, looking at theism, belief in God from the outside, and we have some very interesting conversations because his way of accounting for religion, accounting for human behavior, accounting looking at the universe is so completely different that in a way that etches the contours of my own fundamental convictions, perhaps in ways that I wouldn't if I spent my time uh, pretty much exclusively just talking to people who have so much in common with me. I think that may be helpful as a way of, of promoting and uh, cultivating a spirit of community and unity is to realize how much we have in common. And uh, while the differences are not by any means insignificant or not worth pursuing, but we do have uh, a basis of common commitments, uh, shared history, a vision of what, uh, uh, of what the Lord has done in, the, in, in his world, in God's world, and what God intends to do that we're committed to, and find ways of affirming those uh, as, as often and as fervently as we can. And that might provide a basis for reassurance so that when there are differences in, in various matters, not just differences in perspective, but different uh, evaluations of the importance of the issues, we still have a common, uh, a common sense of fellowship and purpose. It, it seems to me also in terms of, uh, I had a list of ironies I didn't go through, but the, the issue of conscience was another ironic point. I thought some of the best presentations in the conference were when many of the presenters who had gone through programs and because of their faith commitments, they were having the worst time 
by their dissertation chairs, etc. And when they spoke about it, you could feel the pain, and it was like they attended to what God might be saying in Scripture, but maybe they're not attending to what God is saying in their own personal experience, which is as sacred. And trying to live it out in practice and trying to say, how can we better nurture a community that we don't have that kind of hostility from profs, etc. Uh, it seemed just, it, it seemed ironic that those lessons were not drawn out of their own personal story. And I think that's important because we can look out of the church and get lessons as they look in and say, well, you guys have this in common. Or we can look into our congregations. And a congregation is filled with Adventists who are all along the spectrum. And any good pastor recognizes that and asks, how do I nurture and shepherd this discourse community who is a family? And, um, and watch how this family will grow in different ways. I mean, I'm a Jackson, but my brother's family and my sister's families are not like the family we grew up in, but we have a family resemblance. And I think oftentimes we're looking for something more than that in denominational heritages, and I think we're working against the nature of human communities and phenomena. As you're speaking, I, I think of, Rick, your book on becoming, beha behaving, belonging, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> believing, behaving, belonging, and, 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 and how, uh, how uh, you have helped us to see that being in the church is not just believing, and, and that tends to be in the science religion discussion and what went on in the conference, it's all on believing the right propositional things and, and missing the genius of what you're saying, Murray, about, uh, about the family that we're a part of and, 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 and the rich complexity of being Adventist. I mean, it's in our blood. I mean, I could leave the church tomorrow and I'd still be 95% uh, Adventist. Uh, I mean, there's so much more to it. Um, any comment from others before we open it up to uh, to the floor for discussion? I'll make one comment. There's one thing that I think sometimes happens. Um, we each make our choices and we have the right to do that. God gives us a, a choice. And then we, but we don't always look really deeply at what those mean. For instance, we we can be so, um, our experience ties us to the church in such a way that we will never give it up. But, but we can have, we can believe things about science or whatever, and, and those don't bother us because we have this from our childhood, this deep commitment to the church. But sometimes it happens that our students now will look at what we're saying and carry that to its logical conclusion and realize some things we believe just make our religion useless, uh, you know, not even uh, worth considering. And so we don't always think carefully through the implications of the things that we have accepted. Thank you. Um, are there, <coughs> is there a comment, a, a question from uh, members in the audience? Uh, if you would come up to the, uh, to the front. <coughs> Sam, do we have a uh, microphone? There's one over there. Oh, okay, uh, we do have uh, some who want to comment. Uh, if, if you would, uh, give us your, uh, your, your name and then, uh, and then make a, uh, we have 20 minutes. If you could make your comment, your question as uh, concise as possible. Uh, Dean Pauline. I'd like to uh, direct my question to Suzanne because she seems to have had the most engagement with how the conference came together. Um, I taught 25 years at the seminary and it seemed to me that the consensus of the seminary uh, was an older, young life kind of position. Uh, what I heard about the conference, what I've seen in the new fundamental belief seems to be promoting young earth. Uh, was that a, a conscious intention, or did it just sort of happen that way, or did I completely miss the whole discussion? Well, the conference um, and those planning it had nothing to do with um, those working on 
fundamental belief number six. So uh, I can't speak to that, but I can say that um, all of the scientists that I know who also believe in the Bible, um, they are very comfortable with an old earth, young life. However, that belief, it doesn't fix any of the difficulties that we as creationists have that with, with geology. Because even the very oldest rocks, um, you find fossils. And that means there was something alive and something died. And uh, we don't believe that something died until the curse, which was, and you shall show the die. So there was not a conscious attempt to promote young Earth creationism there? Okay. Certainly none of the scientists that were involved in the planning of the conference or who spoke believe that, as far as I know. I, I might even comment that uh, I happen to be uh, slightly in favor of uh, young Earth as well. And I won't go into the reasons here, uh, but um, I didn't get the sense that that the conference was following that line. Yes, uh, Gary Sharp said it. Um, so Protestantism is specifics, right? There's a there's really been a dramatic history over time of Protestant churches splitting and splitting and splitting into ever smaller groups. Uh, and what's really been striking is that that hasn't happened with Adventism nearly as much as you might think, given the level of ideological uh, polarization that we sometimes see. So with that in mind, a short quote from a favorite spiritual writer of mine, and then a question. Most people assume that in a loving relationship, individuals agree with each other. Many people, for example, become scared or shaken when their partner disagrees with them. Then they compound the mistake by trying to change their partner's mind. Yet on a personality level, two people are different in all respects and cannot be made identical in any way. There are no well-matched couples. Friendship is seeing differences, accepting differences, yet continuing to love and be happy. And so I guess the question is, if we, can, if we can see the point of that in our most important intimate relationships, can we not also see it in connection with the life of the community? Um. Some might. Who would like to respond to that rhetor fine rhetorical question? It speaks for itself. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, at two parts. I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Orr or uh, Mrs. Willie, um, and my question is: You're trying to make the the Bible a book of science, which it is not. Neither is it a book of sociology, how we should live particularly for the 21st century, when you think, if you take the literal interpretation of the Bible, and you think of Deuteronomy 21, where you stone your, your son if he's a glutton, or he's drunken, or, uh, or, he, or he backbites, or, or uh, fights with his parents, and you think of all the other issues when the Israelites conquered somebody, and they took the 12-year-old girls and gave them to the conquerors. And I mean, it doesn't tell us how we should live in the 21st century. We're trying to make the Bible fit into science here and now. And why do I say that? Well, even when you read Genesis 1 and 2, they read differently. You can say, well, uh, one was Yahweh, a group that believed in Yahweh, and the other one is Elohim, and that's why they read differently. But we don't take that. We, we either take it allegorically or we take it... Uh, we can take it a lot of different ways, but we don't use it as science. At least most of us don't. Science, what is science? In a short, in my own understanding, you have a hypothesis, you do an experiment, and you have a result. Whether it's H2O, you take hydrogen and oxygen, and two molecules of hydrogen and uh, one molecule of oxygen, put them together, and you have water. Well, you can't use the Bible to do that, but science should be re reproducible as much as we can. We can't. Our origins we cannot uh, solve either way, either with science or with religion. So that was my, I think, that summarizes. Okay, okay. would anybody like to, to respond to Barbara Orr's uh, comment on the difference between science and religion? I would just say, if you want to believe the Bible literally, fine. Just please don't practice it that way. <laughs> I think that, the, that there's a great deal more harmony than, than that. 
that. And in fact, uh, the book that I wrote is entitled Scientific Theology, specifically because I think that the Bible and science can be harmonized not only in terms of the facts on the ground, but also in terms of method. I think the one thing you can't do is to start out science by saying everything must be accounted for on a naturalistic basis. If you start that way, you get things like trying to explain the origin of life without any intelligent input whatsoever. Uh, and uh, so once you realize that there's that kind of bias in the way science is currently practiced, even though it shouldn't be that way, then you realize that perhaps we need to take another look before we just assume that science knows what it's talking about in those areas, in the area of uh, age. Uh, Leonard wants to comment. Oh, just, a, just an additional comment. Um, you mentioned some difference between studying H2O and, and origins. That, that's a very real difference. <clears throat> studying history is not repeatable, and yet many conclusions from geologic history are, are used by many Christians to decide their theology. Um, and, and they're often generally not aware of, of new information coming out, particularly in uh, biological evidence regarding evolution, making it, putting the whole idea of large-scale evolution in deeper and deeper weeds these days with, with new discoveries in biochemistry, etc. Okay, uh, again, keep your comments, uh, questions short, and, uh, and we at the panel, if we keep ours comments uh, short as well, we can get through the seven individuals who are now at the uh, microphones, and uh, we can't take any more. Yes, please. My name is T. Joe Willie. Uh, my comments, I hope, will not be will be neutral and will not be considered confrontational. But I am a scientist, and I'm offended by the fact that science is being used in a manner that's not designed to incorporate. Science has limitations. Science does not deal with the questions of God. Science does not deal with the miraculous. Science does not deal with origin. I don't know where you get the idea that it is. A good scientist has a moral obligation to only believe those evidentiary ev data and evidence and reasonable logic and they do not go beyond that. I keep hearing that amongst our Adventist scientific community, always criticizing science as just being worthless or useless. We are ruining the opportunity for young people in our Adventist educational networks by poisoning their minds against science and trying to teach them to use scientifically inappropriately. It has its limitations. I was particularly drawn to what Leonard Brand stated when he said that there is a limitation to what science can do. It doesn't have that far reach that we've incorporated, that we try to incorporate in our understanding of the world around us. And science has a tre tremendous power to bring understanding to the world that we can observe and gather evidence and we have a moral obligation to only believe those things for which we have the evidence to establish our points of view. Um, is there uh, someone who uh, wants to comment on that? I'll, I'll make a comment. Um, one of the big dangers I see in science on both sides of the debate is that often the conclusion is decided before the data are analyzed. In other words, we already know what we think is truth, so therefore we have to make the data fit our concept of origins or development or whatever it happens to be. And um, just as an example, I was working with a graduate student a few years back who was studying fossils, and his reason for studying the fossils was to prove that those fossils couldn't have been as old as evolutionary theory says they are. So he was trying to find evidence that they're not old, that they're really, you know, within the 6,000 year time frame. And to me, that's, I mean, I appreciated his work, I appreciated his approach, but I thought it was a little bit dishonest because we're not letting the data speak for themselves. We're saying this is what the data have to say. So I have to make sure that I understand them in that sense. I'm not saying that all scientists on either side of the debate do that, but we all 
come to science with certain assumptions, and if we're not careful, we can impose our assumptions on the way we interpret our data. <coughs> I think we're aware that... Uh, Irv Taylor? Irv Taylor. Um, I think we're all aware that coming out of the conference and also coming out of the annual council was a statement that number six, there's a suggestion that that will be changed, and one of the changes suggested is to insert the word recent, a recent creation of life. Um, we have uh, both Professor Brand and Dr. Geem. I wonder if you could tell us what, in your view, recent means. Now, I have heard rumors that uh, both of you have said something like, oh, we could go out to 100,000, 500,000, 300,000, maybe a million or so. What, what do you define recent to be? Your own personal view, just on uh, us laymen, it'd be nice to know. I'll comment on that. Um, I would suggest the real issue is um, a, a, a creation in which God created Adam and Eve and they fell and thus this brings evil um, and sin and death. And that, that had to have been uh, is it that, or is it millions of years of evolution which God used evolution as means of creation, which means God is responsible for death and evil? Those are the choices. Dr. King? Well, there's a difference between what I believe and what I think is reasonable. Difference um, between reasonable and what you uh, in, in terms of In terms of interpreting the, the biblical record the way it was tend to be interpreted when it was written. And what I am saying is, if you were to ask me if I had to put, place a bet, I would probably place one less than 6,000 years. Less than 6,000. Now, um, which means that I'm actually more conservative than Usher in that respect. Um, but if you were to ask me, could I be wrong, yeah. Uh, and, you know, maybe we're looking at um, 6,200, maybe we're looking at 7,500, uh, maybe we're looking at, uh, maybe we're looking at 10,000. I think when you get to 100,000, you're really stretching it a bit. Okay. Um, okay. That okay. helps you. Thank you. John Brunt. I'm a pastor, so my concern on this issue is more on how we relate in a community with each other uh, than maybe some of the actual facts. I have a question. It's not a hypothetical question. It's a real question. And I'd like to hear all the panelists answer it just very briefly. This is a situation. I held a series of evangelistic meetings in the Sligo Church in Tacoma Park, Maryland. There was a gentleman who came to those meetings who had been attending the Sligo Church for six months. He was a scientist at the Smithsonian. His family, his whole family, had, had started attending church. He filled out all the decision cards positively. He was convinced that God wants him to keep the Sabbath. In fact, he had had one job of consulting that he quit. He was making quite a bit of money at it, but he quit it because it involved working on Sabbath, and he didn't believe he should work on Sabbath. He believes Jesus is coming soon. They put their kids in an Adventist school and said it was the greatest thing that had ever happened to them. Their family was just thoroughly enjoying attending the Sligo Church, and they said, we have finally found a home. But this gentleman said, I am absolutely convinced that God is my creator. You could look at Psalm 139, 13 and say, I believe that God knit me in my mother's womb and I am here because God created me. But he said, I just can't bring myself to believe that life hasn't been around on this earth for a long, long time. My question is, if you were in my shoes, would you baptize him? Um, okay, uh, roll call here. Uh, 
starting with Leonard and we'll go go down. Uh, uh, short answers. Um, I'm not a pastor, so I don't have to make that decision. But I, I have dear friends who are in similar situations and I care about helping them to, uh, to have faith in God and uh, I don't need to argue about details if it won't help them. Okay, uh, Murray. As a pastor, I had a rule of thumb. If I wasn't going to put a member out of the church who I knew didn't believe something that was more or less the consensus but were experienced the fellowship in good and regular standing, I wasn't going to not baptize someone into the church who believed likewise. So I, I would ask, do I have members that actually believe that? And if so, fine, I would baptize them. I would tell the person, however, uh, there is no origin to life. Life has always existed because God has always been and there is life in God. So if there was an earth, millions of years, and God's omnipresence is around, then there was life there too. Uh, uh, well, uh, that's not something that I have to deal with on an everyday basis, so I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants on this one. So you take, take it for what it's worth. Uh, my reaction to him would be, um, you're joining a church where the majority of the members, the vast majority of the members outside of certain areas um, <laughs> believe conservatively that life is only a few thousand years old. If, you, if this is the community you wish to join and you wish to learn more, as I hope we all do, then um, I'm ready for you to have a commitment of that kind. Okay. Now, saying that, I'm not sure I would immediately hire him at the local college to teach biology. Oh, oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have to <laughs> worry about it. Uh, Ken. Uh, when Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, I doubt very seriously that he asked him how old he thought the earth was. <laughs> <laughs> to me, uh, you know, the church I go to, we had a pastor who actually baptized someone who did not want to join the Seventh-day Adventist church, but they wanted to be baptized. And so we had a baptism during an Adventist church service for someone who was not interested in joining the church. And I think that was absolutely the right decision. Baptism is not joining the club. Baptism is making a commitment to God. And if you're committed to God, who's to tell you you can't be baptized? Okay, uh, Susie. I'll just be brief. You know, I, I feel very strongly that Christ says, judge not that you be not judged. And I, I, I hopefully everyone knows here that I, I, I don't want to judge anyone. The only reason I take a stand on these issues at all is because I believe the Bible and because I care very deeply about what is taught in our schools. Because these young people are young and impressionable. And so, um, how you believe, that is between you and God, and uh, I'm not saying anything about how you believe. Uh, and thankfully, I am not a pastor, but um, if this person confesses Jesus Christ, that was the prerequisite. Repent and be baptized. Uh, Rick. I like all the answers the panelists have given. Um, John has presented this before, so we've had a conversation in the past. <laughs> Um, I heard a re recently retired General Conference official say something very intriguing and surprising to me, and that was, I think Adventists need a creed. Well, as a theologian, I thought that's exactly what we don't need, and coming from him, I was a bit surprised, but I think what he meant was, in contrast to the rather long statement of fundamental beliefs, which is moving in the direction of seeking more and more specificity, that maybe we could uh, find a way of articulating our deepest convictions as Adventists in ways that would emphasize what we have in common and what we share deeply, rather than the interpretations that, that are likely to divide us. Uh, 
And with that in mind, I'm reminded of, of what Martin Luther said about the first article of the Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And he said that really means I believe that God created me. And uh, it seems to me along that line that somebody could join a community while still having some questions about certain aspects of that community's convictions. Uh, and uh, in that case, along with my fellow panelists, I think there's a place in the Adventist community for people who have some questions about the, these various things. I think we all have questions. We all have unanswered questions and things to wrestle with because uh, things won't be clear until the Lord comes and uh, knowledge is one of those things that passes away, according to Paul. So John, nothing like a case to, uh, to, to, to uh, flush out uh, the truth. And it looks to me like uh, we are unanimous in saying, with varying degrees of enthusiasm, uh, yes. <laughs> um, over on the uh, left. Yeah, Keith Colburn, uh, I'm from the School of Medicine here from Loma Linda. Um, when I graduated from academy, I had 16 years of Adventist schooling. And the next year, I went to the University of Oregon for the next two years, and uh, a biology major, and uh, pre-med. And it was a very devastating experience for a long period of time because uh, I was not prepared. But I think my Bible teachers and the academy teachers thought I should have been prepared by all the stuff that they taught us, which had absolutely no value when I came up against uh, uh, evolution and uh, biology and all. Uh, the struggle went clear back to my very uh, belief in whether there was a God or not, and uh, I spent the last 50 years trying to decide, uh, you know, trying to get proof that there was a God. Uh, I finally come to the conclusion that you can't prove that, and that uh, it's a faith issue and not something that I've got to, to figure out. But I was wondering uh, from the panel here, uh, what if uh, the evidence gets stronger and stronger and stronger that there is a long chronology of life itself? And uh, uh, we then have to decide whether or not uh, you know, there was a literal seven-day creation or not. <coughs> and uh, I know that many Adventists believe that uh, uh, if there isn't that seven-day chronology, there's, the Sabbath is uh, thrown out. Uh, there are many other reasons that people believe in the Sabbath, including uh, our Jewish uh, friends. Uh, and uh, they have some very good reasons to believe in the Sabbath. Why can't uh, we have a big enough tent here in our church right now to be able to have people who do believe in a long chronology that they can also uh, work on the theology of developing a way to look at Sabbath in a different way that's just as valuable as whether or not it was just seven little days of creation? Who would like to address the uh, long chronology Sabbath issue? Well, I'll talk to one aspect of it. <clears throat> I don't determine my belief in the Sabbath based on science, but what I understand from the Bible does help me in my science, because um, out there in, in most scientists, they, they know really only one point of view here, and that is the one that's based on the assumption of uh, long ages of naturalism. Um, those of us who, who practice science and also look at a, a more conservative view understand both points of view and I find that I can, I discover things in geology, in my research, that others simply have not noticed. And the, the, the evidence in favor uh, uh, you know, of, a, of a, a shorter point of view is actually increasing. You won't read that in the scientific literature, but you have to keep, tr keep in touch with uh, the, the the primary research literature to understand what I'm talking about. Okay, um, Susie, were you going to say something? I'm just going to say, I, well, I'm not a geologist. Um, I'm a student of geology. I've taken many geology classes, and I'm working working in that direction. But um, he, he mentioned that there's more and more evidence. Right now, the more and more evidence is going toward there being a short, much more catastrophic events in geology. There being a shorter chronology than, than what the, the previous interpretation of evidence was. When it comes to the question of Sabbath observance, I like to point out to people that the, the Ten Commandments are given twice, and in the Deuteronomy, at least twice, in the Deuteronomy passage, the reason for Sabbath observance has to do with liberation from slavery. And that there are people who 
find different reasons why they find Sabbath meaningful uh, for social reasons. And, and yeah, the tent is big enough. I've pastored an, uh, enough congregations to know you have people in these congregations that do believe in long age and they keep the Sabbath um, and they are in healthy small communities of faith, Adventist communities of faith. That's a fact. Thank you. Yes. My turn. My name is Larry Garrity and I've given um, my career basically to the educational mission of the church. And I'm very concerned that the young people that we have in our colleges today um, are going to leave in droves if the current leadership of the church insists on a recent young age, including a worldwide flood. I happen to be an archaeologist, so let's leave aside the geological problems. Dr. Wood, for whom the Archaeology Museum at Southern is named, established the earliest fixed date in history based on astronomical research, which still stands. 1991 BC for the beginning of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt. That means that there are still 12 dynasties that are older than 1991 BC. A recent 6,000 years creation of the Earth and the dating of the Flood leaves 500 years at the most for a worldwide flood having occurred. And you have to squeeze in there all of our history that we have written documents for. We have languages. We have astronomical events that have been observed. We know how to date these things. There is not room to accommodate a short recent history based on just the archaeological and historical evidence that we have. And our young people are smart enough to know these things and to read about them. Does anyone on the panel join me in worrying about a max, mass exodus of millennials from our church if we keep going in the direction we're going? That's my question. Uh, uh, any, any response to that? Um, I worry about a mass exodus, but I would suggest there, there are other reasons, maybe quite different from the one you presented, that might cause an exodus. But anybody want to comment on the substance of his point that there is this archaeological uh, evidence uh, which seems to be uh, counter the uh, short chronology? Uh, Paul, I would say you're, you gave some very specific numbers. Uh, have you thought about the questions that Dr. Garrity has raised? Well, as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why uh, I tried not to say that, that my opinion should be fixed in stone because I think, first of all, I could be wrong. Secondly, even if I am right, there is enough evidence for some of the other positions that I don't think it's fair to expect everybody else to come up to my opinion. That's assuming that it's coming up to my opinion. Uh, and. That's why when people are careful, they usually don't say 6,000 years ago. They usually say a few thousand years ago, and that leaves room to put some of those events back further. I agree with you that if the Middle Kingdom is uh, securely dated at uh, 1991, that you have a major problem and you're probably at least going to have to go to Septuagint numbers to get all of the uh, uh, civilizations in. And uh, okay, I think we're going to let you and Larry talk about this afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do, I want, I want to make the point that that is in fact separable from the question of uh, do we have to go to millions of years. I think, uh, Rick. Very quickly, I think we need to be very careful about presenting uh, only one solution uh, or one way of, of arguing for a particular position. Uh, I had a student in a program I won't identify who uh, revealed in a paper that I had in class, it didn't come out in discussion, that 
he had been raised with all the assurance that we had abundant evidence to support a very conservative way of looking at things. And as his education proceeded, he discovered that those, those reasons simply failed to be convincing and he was willing to give up the whole thing. And so I think if we, even if we present a very, uh, what should I say, conservative interpretation of things with good reasons to support them, we should be open, as, as Paul has indicated, we should be open to uh, presenting uh, evidence for another position as well, so at least uh, our students are aware of the fact that it's not as cut and dried as, as uh, some of us believe it may be. Okay, uh, yes, please. Uh, Kirby Obert, um, from here in Loma Linda. I am also a Department of Pathology and Human Anatomy with Dr. Wright. Maybe I'm sorry if I gave that association, it might be bad for you. <laughs> I, I teach here, I teach embryology. I'm a scientist in developmental biology. Um, I've taken Dr. Brand's course. <coughs> and my question now, if the church has made a decision for me on where we need to be looking as far as evolution and creation, is there a need for scientists that are studying this topic about evolution creation? Do we need to have scientists? Are we trying to create the next generation of scientists to even know about evolution? Should we do that? Because it seems like that would be if we've been told the truth, we no longer need to be seekers of truth. Okay. Um, Who is question? Yeah. Um, I, I'm the educator. Uh, Leonard Brandt. I, I teach a course here to our graduate students in philosophy of science and origins. And in that class, the way I've approached this, they have to know um, everything that science has to say and also understand other ways of looking at it. I tell them, I hope you come out uh, thinking like I do, but, but I don't want you to come there because I say it. You need to learn to, under, to be thinkers and to understand how to evaluate the evidence and uh, you know, critically evaluate and decide for yourself. So we do need scientists and we need them because uh, one reason we need them is because there are approaches to, to, to these questions that other, most of science is simply not thinking about. We have something to contribute. Um, things that others are, are, are not approaching or are not seeing because they have, they have, they start with a bias of naturalism. So yes, we do need science. Okay, uh, yes, sir. I'll try to be very brief. My name is Eugene Joseph, and I was preceded here by three people who I appreciate very much. Anyways, I have one concern, well, a few, but one was... Um, but maybe your chief one. <laughs> your chief concern. All right, I'll put all two into one. And so, <laughs> uh, I was at the conference, and one of the, the um, disappointments, maybe, was that I listened for them to speak about our young people. And no word was said about our young people in terms of applying James Fowler's uh, method of saying, okay, how do we approach this thing about faith development? I get students in my class, and they come with questions. And typically what I find is that they have been shut down, no, we don't speak about that, and they get frustrated. So I have that one concern. Part B, turns yeah. out that when I try to raise this issue, um, ironically, I come across a little, forgive the phrase, Darwinian protectionism. Let me explain. Turns out that sometimes we are not necessarily totally intellectually honest. So that, instead of saying it like it is, raising the questions, we protect ourselves in terms of being, um, well, let me put this very simply, maintaining a job, <coughs> we toe the line, and then our young people are the ones who suffer, because now they're going, okay, I can't say what I think, they don't want to listen to me, I find that in my classroom, when students have questions and I say to them, look, I believe this way. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. God has the answer. Now, let's consider him. And if we are Seventh-day Adventists believing that there's a Holy Spirit and we are honest about 
even though we may have different opinions in our trajectory of growth, I think that the Holy Spirit is faithful enough in his or her own time to reveal to us where we need to be at a given time. And until the church realizes this and listens to our young people, we will have these debates. And as that happens, our young people will be leaving the church through the back doors. I invite us to consider our young people and what our debates mean for them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have a last gentleman who has a yes. comment, question. You, you saved the, the last gentleman who's always the shortest wherever he goes. <laughs> I'm not an Adventist, but my wife and my daughters are both uh, Adventists. I'd like to offer my congratulations to that gentleman over there. We don't have all the answers, that's for sure. And my question is, I'm not an Adventist, I'm not a scientist, I was a teacher. But the scientists seem to base their belief on the age of the world, on the rock formations and the, the fossils that they found. And none of them were around at that time. I wasn't around and none of us were. So we don't have to believe that because in 1960, some of you may remember, and I was waiting for someone on the panel to say something about this, Mount St. Helens exploded. In, in three days, the formations that were revealed that the scientists took, said took thousands of years to create, was created in three days. And I'd like the gentleman uh, who was the pastor to take that information back to his uh, friend and uh, perhaps that might make him understand or help him understand that he doesn't have to believe the world was created millions of years ago, that it could have been created much sooner. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we have gone over, but we have allowed those who were at the mics to, to speak. Uh, I, again, want to thank the panelists for, uh, for taking this uh, invitation seriously. And, and I, I believe uh, some significant engagement uh, took place uh, among us. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling uh, good about uh, this, this project uh, of honest, intelligent, educated people in the church uh, talking about these issues uh, from our heads and our hearts. Uh, thank you again. And let's thank the uh, panel, please. And thank you all for coming. And uh, if you want to get notices about other sort of meetings, make sure your name, your email is on a uh, list that went around.